Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Amatech SCI Understanding UPS Designs webinar. Um, as always, I'd like to start off by asking if everybody can hear me loud and clear. If you can, just type in the chat bar that you can hear me. That would be appreciated and it gives time for everybody to join in the webinar as well. Good stuff, you can hear me. So, my name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager here at Amtech Soil State Controls. Um, I work out of the Stafford office in Houston, Texas, um, and I have 20 years in the industrial UPS industry. I've worked with nearly all of the major UPS manufacturers and charger manufacturers, um, so I have a good deal of information um, uh, that I can pass on to people. Uh, there will be a lag of around 30 seconds between you hearing my voice and me seeing a reply in the chat bar. Basically what Webinar Jam does is uh, it's got to send this webinar out to uh, iOS devices, Android devices, and Windows-based devices. So um, there is some processing time um, when it does that. So, um, from you hearing my voice, for me seeing a comment in the chat bar can take between 15 and 30 seconds. Webinar Jam has a panic button. So what that does is if something in the system crashes, then what I can do is I can press the panic button and that opens a new room up for everybody and we can carry on from where we left off. Uh, Webinar Jam does seem to be a very stable platform. We've never had an issue with it since we've started. And now I've said that we're probably gonna have one today, but um, uh, it's been uh, really good for us so far. Uh, the webinar will be recorded um, immediately after the webinar is finished. Uh, webinar Jam uh, does upload it and uh, it will send you a link to their version of it. The problem with their link is that um, it's it's treated like another webinar. You can't fast forward, rewind it um, or pause it. Um, it's treated like a normal webinar. So what our fantastic marketing department does is they download the video from Webinar Jam, put it on our YouTube channel, and we will send you a link to that. And therefore you can play, pause, rewind, skip, do whatever you need to do um, if necessary. And the webinar should last around about one hour, depending on how much I talk and how many questions we get. So we do try and keep it to an hour, okay? So today we're going to be trying to understand the major UPS topologies, um, the designs of most major UPSs, understand the blocks of different UPS systems, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the topologies, and discuss the power flow and general operation of each topology. And one thing that I did forget to mention is, if you do have a question, uh, type it into the chat bar, but I usually leave all the questions until the end. So if you put a question in, um, I will go back at the end and see any questions that I haven't answered, okay? So um, here are the main things about a UPS uh, that you need to know the basics of. So first of all, you're gonna have a normal source AC input, which is also called the primary supply. This is the uh, three phase AC that goes into the rectifier charger system. Then we have a battery charger or a rectifier, which converts the normal source AC into DC. Uh, that feeds the inverter bus and also charges the batteries. Then we have the batteries. Uh, the, the only reason the batteries are there is to provide backup during a loss of the normal uh, AC source. And then we have an inverter, which converts the DC back to AC and provides power to the load circuits. We also have a bypass power source or an auxiliary power source, which can also be called the reserve supply. I don't know why we have so many names for bypass, but it's it, they're interchangeable, bypass, auxiliary, or reserve supply. Um, another part of a, a UPS is the static transfer switch. And that is an automatic switch that connects load to inverter or load to bypass. And it is a switch that has no moving parts, which is why it's called a static switch. Um, uh, it uses SCRs to uh, switch 
between which supply it's going to choose. And then last but no means least, we have a remote bypass switch or a manual bypass switch, which is a make before break switch, which removes power from the UPS cabinet to allow safe maintenance procedures. This is a physical switch or a breaker arrangement. So there is moving parts. These are actually physical switches. Um, so there is moving parts in the remote bypass switch. Okay. So we're going to start off with a what would be considered a normal commercial UPS. Uh, this is taken directly from a commercial UPS manufacturer's manual. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. Um, but there's a few things that I want to discuss that kind of tells you the difference between a commercial UPS and a uh, industrial UPS. And the first thing is you will notice is the inputs and the outputs of this commercial UPS. What you will find is most commercial UPSs um, use three phase 480 volts AC um, directly into the UPS itself. And also if you look down the bottom here, the battery for this system is also 480 volts DC. And there's a specific reason that the commercial UPS manufacturers do that. And you know, basically it's down to Ohm's law. P is equal to VI or IV, whichever way you look at it. So if you're putting out, say, one kilowatt of power, OK, um, let's choose a battery, for example. That means um, one kilowatt divided by 480 volts. Uh, you're talking about uh, 20 amps, OK, for a 480 volt battery. But if you had, like we have in the industrial world, a 120 volt battery, that's four times the current. So you would have 80 amps coming from the battery at full load. Oh, sorry, I said one kilowatt, I meant 10 kilowatts, my apologies. So you would have 80 amps uh, going. So you can see that what the commercial UPS manufacturer um, does by making everything high voltage is they reduce the amount of current that's seen at full load. And what that allows them to do is that allows them to reduce the size of the cabling inside the UPS, and it allows them to choose uh, the semiconductors inside the converter charger and the inverter, the IGBTs in that system, they're gonna be a lot smaller as well. So it reduces the, the cost um, of the internal components of the UPS. The unfortunate thing about that is obviously working on a 480 volt DC battery is far more uh, dangerous than working on a 120 volt uh, DC battery. Okay, and also you can see this uh, statement here, the DC bus inside a commercial UPS can be as high as 650 volts DC because um, the power flow this way here, there, there actually is just a bridge rectifier on the input to a commercial UPS, usually anyway, and that just, um, converts the 480 volts AC into DC, which can be as high as 650 volts DC. Once again, it saves cable sizing and IGBT sizes and things like that. Okay. And the other thing that you'll notice about this commercial UPS is uh, there are contactors inside the UPS. And you can see here, user supplied. The circuit breakers are actually the buckets inside your MCC. At the UPS itself, for this manufacturer, they have contactors inside the UPS. And if anybody has worked in the electrical world long enough to know, contactors are moving parts and they have coils and they pull in, drop out, they can, the contacts can weld, the coils can burn out and uh, not operate correctly. So contactors, unfortunately, um, can fail and do fail. So uh, we do not like using contactors in our UPS, but in, in many commercial UPSs, uh, they are used. And the other thing that you'll notice about the commercial UPS is there are no isolation transformers. And that's extremely important. There should be, uh, for an industrial UPS, uh, an isolation transformer on the input to the rectifier inverter. And there should be uh, some form of isolation transformer on the output of the inverter to the load circuits. Okay. What these 
commercial manufacturers tend to do is they say, okay, uh, we make one type of system. It's 480 volts in, 480 volts out. And if you want a transformer, then we expect you to put the transformer external um, to the system. Because obviously, if this is 480 volts out, then most uh, distribution boards are going to be 208, sorry, 208, 120. Uh, so you're going to you're going to need a transformer on the output anyway. So uh, bear that in mind when you when you're starting to price a UPS. Um, you may find out that you're going to have to buy external transformers if you go down the route of choosing a commercial UPS. So here is the the normal power flow for a commercial type UPS. Uh, you can see at the bottom right hand corner there, red is a normal power flow, and green mean means it's energized and ready to supply the power if necessary. And if you follow, um, we've got our 480 volts input going in here. It goes in to the converter charger um, and that gets changed into 480 volts DC for this system. And then that DC also feeds into the inverter. The inverter changes that DC back into AC and that goes through the contactor here and out to your load circuits, okay, at 480 volts. You can see on the top here, we have our 480 volt bypass supply, three phase coming in. It stops, I haven't drawn these the way, this is from the UPS manufacturer's uh, manual and they don't choose what position these contactors are in. But you can see that contactor will be open, CB3 will be closed, so we will have power at the uh, static transfer switch. Um, but because that switch is not on, then uh, we will not be passing current through the static transfer switch. Now I'm just looking on the chat bar. It says, did you lo lock up? So does anybody else have any, any issues with the webinar so far? If so, please do let us know in the chat bar. So that is a normal power flow through the inverter, out to the loads, and bypass is available if necessary. Now then, if we have a power failure, in other words, the AC input to the UPS fails, then that means there is no power to the rectifier charger, okay? So therefore, we start to supply power to the inverter from the battery. And you can see in a commercial UPS, we actually have a DC to DC converter. Um, so it's an additional point of failure in a commercial UPS, because remember our battery is 480 volts. Our DC bus is around about 650 volts. So we need to boost the battery voltage up to the bus voltage into the inverter um, to get the voltage required for the inverter to change the, AC, the DC to AC. So um, that is a single point of failure. If the DC to DC converter fails, then you have no power going to the inverter, even though you have capacity in your battery, which obviously is not a, a good situation um, if you have critical loads like we do in the petrochemical and power generation industries. Okay. And as the battery depletes, Eventually, it will get down to a point where it says, OK, um, I have to disconnect the batteries because they have dropped below a certain voltage. So you can see here our battery is no longer available. So the inverter turns off. And what happens is the static transfer switch for the UPS will turn on um, and it will allow power from the bypass to go down this way here. OK. So that's what the static, sorry, the static transfer switch does. It sees that the output of the inverter has failed and it will transfer to the bypass supply automatically without um, any issues whatsoever um, to the load circuits. Okay, and then the final position is uh, for a commercial UPS is a static transfer switch is actually just a momentary switch, okay? And what it does is it allows power to be transferred seamlessly 
um, through the SCRs in the static transfer switch. What a commercial UPS does is they underrate their SCRs and they only, um, they're only expected to carry load for a very short period of time because what they do after the transfer has um, gone okay, they will then pull in this contactor and that will allow power to flow to load circuits through a contactor rather than through the, uh, I, uh, the SCRs in the static transfer switch. So that is um, how a commercial UPS works. If you've lost video or audio, um, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be uh, a major issue. Everybody else seems to be um, joined okay. So I would say refresh your browser and join again. Uh, that should help you out. I apologize for the inconvenience. So this drawing here, this is an industrial UPS. And in fact, it's actually the drawing from an Amatec SCI UPS. And you can see uh, a few differences already. First of all, our AC input um, is 480 volts, similar to the commercial UPS. But in most cases for an industrial UPS, the bypass source will be 120 volts single phase and the AC output will be 120 volts single phase. It can be 208 um, three phase, uh, 120, or in fact, it can even be split phase 240, 120, depending on your needs. But the majority of the UPSs we sell are 120 volt single phase outputs. There's a good reason for that, which we'll discuss um, in a moment. But more importantly, you can see here built into the design of our UPS, we have isolation transformers. And uh, I'll take an opportunity to tell you why isolation transformers are very very important. If we have a failure in the battery charger rectifier, let's say there's a short circuit, okay? That would allow the DC to feed back all the way to the MCC if we didn't have an isolation transformer. And if you know anything about um, electrical transformer theory, if you have an isolation transformer, DC cannot pass from the secondary to the primary or the primary to the secondary, okay? So therefore DC cannot pass through this transformer. So even if we have a failure in our rectifier, you cannot get DC back on your switchboard that feeds a 480 volts. Because if obviously if you've got DC back onto your uh, MCC, that is gonna wreak havoc on some of your other loads connected um, to your MCC. And the same can be said for the output. If we have a failure in the inverter, a short, then we could, in theory, get DC going to the load circuits, which would be a very bad thing as well. So this transformer here gives us isolation between the DC and the AC, and there is no possible way that DC can pass through the transformer. That's inherent in its design, okay? So it's very, very important in the industrial world that you have a UPS that has isolation transformers. And it's usually specced in by most petrochemical and power plants anyway. So here's the power flow for an Amatec SCI UPS. So once again, we have AC coming in here, 480 into our battery charger rectifier. It actually gets transformed down to about 130 volts AC into our rectifier. And then our bus is 120 volts nominal. Now we do do a 240 volt bus if necessary, but the majority of our systems are 120 volts nominal. In other words, they are connected to a 60 cell lead acid battery usually. Okay, and what you will notice here, there is no DC to DC converter, a single point of failure at this point here, okay? There is nothing between the battery and the inverter input that uh, could fail, unlike the uh, commercial UPS. So we go in here, AC gets converted to DC, DC then goes into the inverter, and that gets changed into AC through our output transformer into our inverter static switch and out to our AC outputs. Uh, that is normal um, operation. And then our bypass source will be going to the bypass static switch, but the bypass static switch will not be switched on. So therefore, 
power will not be flowing through uh, that at this moment in time. So once again, similar to the commercial UPS, if we have an AC input failure, in other words, we lose our 480 volt feed into the battery charger rectifier, then there is no switching that happens. Uh, the output from the rectifier is in parallel with the uh, battery, okay? So in normal operation, it charges the battery, but if our DC from the rectifier disappears, the battery doesn't switch on, the battery is just there anyway. Uh, it's just like if you pull the power cable from your laptop, it doesn't switch to battery, the battery is just there automatically. Um, and the inverter doesn't care whether the, bat the DC voltage is coming from the, the charger or the battery, all it cares about is its voltage is between 105 to 140 volts for our normal systems. As long as the DC is between that range, the inverter does not care and converts that DC back into AC. So with an AC input failure, um, you will get an alarm on the UPS, but it will continue supplying AC to your load circuits through the inverter from the battery. Okay. And then if the power failure is prolonged and the batteries deplete and on a 60 cell system that would be down to 105 volts DC because most battery manufacturers stipulate the capacity of their battery down to 1.75 volts per cell and if you multiply 1.75 times 60 amazingly enough you get 105 volts DC. So what happens is um, inside the logic of our UPS, we are monitoring the DC at this point here. And it says, OK, if we go below 105 volts DC, we send a signal to the static switches and we turn on the bypass static switch. And then we turn off instantaneously at the same time the inverter static switch. And it's a make before break transition on the, the supplies. And then immediately after that has happened, what we do is we send a shunt trip signal to our battery input breaker. And we trip this breaker to disconnect the batteries from the system and protect them from being over discharged. OK. And then if you wanted to do maintenance uh, on the system, then what you can do is you can move the manual bypass switch. Now remember, so we have our static switch here and our manual bypass switch. Uh, we can move the manual bypass switch to the bypass position, which allows power to flow around the bypass static switch. We take that out of circuit and the power flows out to our load circuits and we can actually work inside the UPS here if necessary and do repairs, replace parts um, and do maintenance. So that's the basics of uh, UPS systems, the difference between commercial and the difference between um, industrial. So there is also different designs of systems. So the first one we're going to discuss is um, Probably it's the most expensive option, but it is by far the most um, reliable option is to have a dual redundant UPS. OK, and what that means is, say uh, your design engineers said, right, we need 30 kVA of load. OK, maximum we're going to see is 30 kVA of load and you want to design a really robust UPS system. Then in a parallel redundant system, what you would have to do is you would have two 30 kVA UPS systems. And they have to be the same manufacturer, the same model, and they have, you know, there, there are a lot of people who say you can just put two UPSs together and parallel them, um, different manufacturers or different models. You can't do that. To parallel, to truly parallel a system, you absolutely have to have 
uh, the same model, uh, the same manufacturer, because there is logic between the two UPSs that need to control the synchronization between um, each UPS to make sure that they can run in true parallel. Okay. Now, in dual parallel redundant um, design, if we have an AC power failure on only one of the UPSs, then that rectifier is no longer in operation. And what happens is that UPS will go onto battery operation. Um, remember, the inverter doesn't care where the DC comes from, and the inverter will continue supplying its power to the load circuit. So they will, the two UPSs will still run in parallel um, while you have a primary AC failure. Uh, Howard, uh, there is no cost to this uh, presentation, so uh, you can stay on. Don't worry about it. I was just answering a question in the chat bar there. Now, what happens if one of the redundant UPSs fail completely or if the battery completely depletes then what happens is um, the static switch for that ups will turn off but the other ups will carry on supplying the load without any issues whatsoever because remember you have to have a 30 kva here because of the load and therefore if we lose this ups we still have the full 30 kVA of the other UPS to supply to the load circuits, okay? And what that also means is you can actually take a whole UPS out of service for maintenance, repairs. You can even replace it if absolutely necessary while the other UPS feeds the load circuit. So it gives you much more flexibility if you have a parallel redundant UPS. And then if both inverters fail in parallel redundant um, design, then you still have the bypass supply and the static switch here will switch the bypass to the load circuits. So, you know, you can have one UPS fail, then the other UPS fail, and then you've still got power going to your load circuits. So they are so reliable. Now, the other uh, parallel design that you can have is where you parallel the, the, the loads instead of the UPSs itself. So in this circumstance, and what you'll find on many, many DCS systems now, that most of the DCS systems that are designed will have more than one input to them. Um, in truth, these days, they usually have three inputs to them. So you can have two UPS inputs to the DCS system and also a regular um, AC input from grid power as well to really give you reliability. And what you can see here, the benefits of this system is you don't have to have identical UPSs, although it's always recommended. Uh, they should always be the same power rating, obviously. But the the loads are actually fed separately into the AC to DC converters inside the loads themselves. So um, the outputs of the UPSs are not actually connected in parallel because it's the DC side at this point here where it's connected in parallel. So this isn't a true parallel redundant system. This is where the loads are fed redundant, redundantly from individual UPSs. Okay. Now, if we have an AC input fail, um, we will go into battery operation on this bottom UPS. Remember, the inverter doesn't care where it gets its DC from, so it's going to still change that DC into AC and both power supplies are going to carry on working as they should. And then if this whole UPS down here fails, then what will happen is this UPS will switch to bypass. So you will still have power going to this power supply and this power supply from the other UPS. So you still have redundancy 
even if the UPS completely fails and transfers to bypass. And then the other mode of operation to have uh, redundancy is what's called cascade UPS. So in this picture here, you have one UPS, this one here at the bottom, this would be classified as your main UPS. And then this UPS here would be classed as your backup or slave UPS. And what you can see is the slave UPS is energized uh, but what it does is actually it feeds the bypass static switch for the main UPS. So in normal operation, the main UPS is feeding all of the load uh, circuits through its static switch. So AC to DC through the rectifier, DC to AC through the inverter, and that AC goes to the loads. And then only if the master UPS fails, Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. If we go on to, if we have a primary AC supply loss, the main UPS will go to battery operation, okay? And continue to change that DC into AC and feed the load circuits that way there. And only when we have either an inverter failure or if the battery depletes, what will happen is the main UPS um, output will fail. And what will happen is the primary AC UPS through its inverter and through the bypass static switch. So this is the main UPS, the main UPS static switch. It will turn on and it will say, OK, I'm going to let the slave UPS or the backup UPS supply power to my load circuits. And we still have a battery backing up this UPS. So it's also a very good design if you want redundancy. Um, so that's the three types you can get. You can get dual parallel redundant, you can have uh, parallel loads, or you can have cascade UPS. Um, they're all more expensive because you have to buy two UPSs, but they give you far more reliability. And then if both UPSs, I forgot this slide was here, if both UPSs in the cascade operation fail, so that one's failed, that one's failed, you still have the bypass supply going to your load circuits. So very reliable way of designing a UPS system. I'm just going to take a drink of water. What we're going to discuss next is also the, the external maintenance bypass switch. And what this allows you to do, it allows you to work on the UPS safely and perform maintenance, replace parts um, and do various things. You can even replace a UPS if you have an external uh, maintenance bypass switch. So in normal operation, once again, we've got our power flow through here. Now we have the key down here. So N is for normal. BTL is bypass to load and BI is bypass isolate. So in normal, all of the normal contacts, so there's normal there and there is normal there, are in the position shown on this drawing. So power will flow out through the UPS, through this contact and out to our load circuits here. And you can see that the bypass supply, it is energized. So we are allowing power through to the bypass static switch. So it is available, static switch, but it's not turned on. The inverter static switch is turned on and that's where the power is flowing. And you can also see through this contact here that we do have power available here, but the contact for the bypass switch has not moved yet. It's not been physically moved. So it is ready, but it's um, not supplying power. So we if we want to move the bypass switch to the bypass to load position, you'll see in the next slide what happens. The first thing that you need to do, and uh, it should be part of the procedure on front of any UPS, you first have to transfer to static bypass, and then you move the bypass switch to the bypass to load position. So you can see BTL there, bypass to load there, okay? So in the bypass to load position, power will flow 
into our static switch and it will go down to this point here, but we have moved this switch contact to this position now. So the actual power flow is out round here, down through there and out to your loads. So basically at this point here, we have bypassed the uh, both static switches in the UPS and we are going through the manual bypass switch or the maintenance bypass switch contacts now, okay? And then the final position is bypass isolate. And actually, I'll go back to the previous slide. You can see this contact here is in the middle position. So we're still supplying power into the bypass static switch here. But on our next slide, you can see that we've gone to the bypass isolate position. So that actually removes power from this static switch. The power flow is still the same out to our load circuits down out to the load here. But now we have no power in the static switch. And if we wanted to, we could turn the primary AC supply off. We could switch off the rectifier input breaker. And that would make the whole inside of this UPS volt free and safe to work on. Obviously, we'd need to use the correct lockout tagout procedures to do that. And this is an Amatec SCI um, maintenance bypass switch drawing. And some people say our drawings can be slightly confusing because we always show the block diagram for the UPS. And then we have a separate page for a block diagram for our maintenance bypass, which are RMBS. And there's actually a good reason for that. It's because they are sold separately. Some people only buy a UPS and they don't buy the RMBS. And some people buy our RMBS for a different UPS manufacturer. So we have to issue separate drawings for each of those parts. But I do understand it can be slightly confusing because these terminology here, the bypass source AC input, the AC output, um, and this is a normal uh, AC input, and this is the bypass output terminals, those designations do confuse a lot of people. But what you will see is the way that Amatec SEI do their drawings is all of the cable numbers should match. So this, this cable here is a bypass input to the UPS and it's labeled 110. So you connect 110 to 110 in the bypass switch. And once again here, we have 199 connected to 199. Um, as long as you follow the cable, the cabling correctly, that's how you connect our RMBS uh, to your system. Okay. And as you can see, the power flow in this one will be out through the static switch, out through that contact there. This is our load here. Okay. That is normal operation. And then if we went to maintenance bypass, what would happen is we would come down here that contact would close and we would go out to our loads here and this would open. So we don't have power flow back through there. And then when you go to bypass isolate, it actually goes down this way here. This will open, this will open. So there's no power on these terminals, no power on these terminals. If you then isolate the bucket for the AC input to this UPS here, isolate the battery input there, then you are completely volt free. And if you really wanted to, you could take this UPS out of service, remove it and install a brand new UPS uh, without any issues. And your load circuits are still energized without any issues whatsoever. So you don't need to take an outage if you have a remote maintenance bypass switch. So now we will move on to common misconceptions. And I love this uh, saying from Albert Einstein, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. So although they are misconceptions, they are, you know, you don't work on UPSs every day. I do. So there are a lot of things that I understand and I know that I wouldn't expect anybody else to know. So I'm going to try and explain some of those common misconceptions away. And the first one is I need a three phase 208 output UPS. Now, basically, in 
of UPSs that we sell, you do not need a 208 volt UPS. There are never or very, very rarely 208 three phase loads connected to a UPS. In 99% of the time, what happens is the 208 will go to a distribution board and then you, you will use the neutral and you will go phase to neutral and use the 120 supply out of that distribution board. OK. So. The, the problem with using a 208 UPS, and I understand if you already have a 208 distribution board and you're just replacing like for like, like I understand why you would do that. That's absolutely not a problem. But you've got to remember a 208 UPS will not clear a fault on the output as good as a single phase 120 volt UPS. So let's take the, this example here. A 10 kVA three phase UPS will only be able to supply 28 amps per phase. And then an identical 10 kVA single phase UPS will be able to supply 83 amps uh, for its single phase output, okay? Now, if we bring up a uh, trip curve, we can see here the multiples of rated current down the bottom here. Let's say, so this is a 10 amp circuit breaker. Let's say you're protecting some of your loads with a 10 amp circuit breaker. Then for this, the three phase system, you are going to have, so we said 24 amps, roughly around about this point here, you are gonna have about two and a half uh, times the current there. So you're not gonna trip that breaker uh, until it's between four or six seconds, okay? But if you had the single phase system, and this is a 10 amp breaker, you're gonna be in this region here, you're gonna have eight times the current, which is 80 amps there. So you are going to trip before 0 0.01 seconds, so 10 milliseconds. So you can see quite clearly that um, you are gonna clear a fault much, much better with a single phase UPS compared to a three phase UPS, okay? The other misconception is a 10 kVA UPS will give, oh, there's a typo there, will give you 10 kilowatts of power once again. In most circumstances, that is not correct. Most UPSs are rated at 0 0.8 power factors. We, Amtec SCI, do offer UPSs designed at unity power factor, but you have to specify that at the design stage. So for the majority of UPSs are out there, that means that a 10 kVA will only give you 8 kilowatts of real power. So in other words, if you connect a purely resistive load bank to a 10 kVA UPS, you will only be able to load that UPS up to eight kilowatts before current limit, limit situations will arise. And that is because of the power factor um, for a purely resistive load is unity. So most loads connected to UPS systems include power supplies and other inductive capacitive loads, and that will decrease the factor power factor, sorry, round about to 0 0.8. Um, so that's why uh, most UPSs are all stipulated at a 0 0.8 power factor. Ooh. The next common misconception is we lost power to the input of the UPS. Why didn't we switch to bypass? This is a very, very common um, statement from a lot of people. But you've got to remember, if you lose power to the input of the UPS, that means something has happened at your MCC. There's something going on in your plant that is not correct. And if you've lost power to the UPS, that probably means you've lost power to a lot of other stuff as well, whether it's analyzers, pumps, uh, many other things. So your plant is going to be in a transient period. And while that is happening, there are going to be things switching on and off uh, in an uncontrolled manner to go up and down, have uh, a lot of fluctuations on it. And what I, you know, there's a lot of words on this slide. It's much better if I go to the next slide and you see what happens. So on this UPS, MCC1 feeds the AC input to the uh, UPS. MCC2 feeds the bypass supply. Okay, but if you look at the top here, 
they're fed from the 4160 medium voltage bus. Oh, oh, we lost you. Can everybody hear me again? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I told you I may have to use a panic button. I'll wait a few seconds here to see if people can hear me. Oh, Terry says he can hear me. So, uh, I'll just wait on reconnected. Everybody's reconnected. I hit reconnect and you came back on again. Okay. See, I cursed myself at the start of this webinar by saying that webinar jam is very, very good. So everybody's saying if you reconnect, it should all work again. Cool. So I'll go back to here. So first of all, like I said, MCC1 has failed, but MCC2 is still going to be supplied by the 4160 coming in here. So if this 4160 supplies MCC3, which is a three-phase uh, pump, that pump is probably stopped at this stage now. So that's going to cause a transient. So we can't trust this bypass supply. It could be doing all sorts of weird things. So when we lose the primary AC input to our UPS, we want to be on battery because that battery goes into our inverter and that inverter creates perfect 120 volts AC out. You can see there that that's a perfect sine wave. No problems whatsoever. It doesn't matter what's going on on this bypass supply here. The output of this UPS with everything that's going on at your MCC is going to be absolutely perfect and your load circuits are going to be good. So I hope that explains why we don't transfer to bypass when we lose AC input power. We want to go to battery. Okay. Another misconception, the battery breaker on the UPS is tripped. Do I have a bad battery? Well, I mentioned this earlier. Um, the battery manufacturers specify the ampere hour capacity of their battery at a certain rating down to 1.75 volts per cell. So for this example, an Enesis 3CC9 will give you 200 ampere hours for eight hours and they say that the end voltage will be 1.75 volts per cell, okay? Battery manufacturers recommend that a lead acid cell should not ever be discharged past 1.6 volts per cell because that can lead to damage that cannot be reversed. So the only way to protect the battery from over discharge is for the UPS to prevent the battery going below this voltage. And what happens is Amatec SCI will trip the input breaker at 1.75 times the number of cells. So for a 60 cell system, it's going to be 105 volts DC. So if you walk up to a UPS and you've had any power disruptions in your plant, it is not the battery usually that has caused that um, breaker to trip. It's the UPS to protect the batteries has caused it to trip. Because a lot of people think, okay, um, it's probably a high current situation that tripped the battery breaker. But no, it's usually down to the protection in the UPS that caused that battery breaker to trip. So what we would recommend that you do in that situation is follow the procedure on the front of the UPS to close that battery breaker in again. Another common misconception, we had a fault on a load circuit and the UPS transfer to bypass. It shouldn't do that. Why did it do that? Well, the problem is inverters have devices in them that must be protected from overcurrent situations. And they're usually IGBTs, which are insulated gate bipolar transistors. And that's the device that does the switching. So for a 10 kVA UPS, single phase UPS, the output current rating is 83 amps if you consider the, eight, the 0 0.8 power factor. So at a certain point after 83 amps is reached, the system will go in current limit to protect the IGBTs. 
because you know for a 10 kVA system uh, we're expecting to see 83 amps we're probably going to put in uh, because we usually overrate our IGBTs at SCI we're going to probably put in 150 amp IGBTs um, to give us a buffer um, other manufacturers will be a, have a lot tighter um, specs for their IGBTs but the problem with IGBTs is they are very sensitive to overcurrent. So if it did go above, let's say we did use IGBTs that were rated at 150 amps. If we went above 150 amps, those IGBTs could be destroyed. Okay, so we want to prevent uh, blowing the inverter bridge up if at all possible. So the way that we do that is we use current limit on the inverter. We can actually limit the current that the inverter will supply. And current limit is simply reducing the voltage of the system to maintain the current at a certain level. So let's say we have 83 amps on a 120 volt system. Using Ohm's law, we can figure out that therefore the load is roughly 1.44 ohms. OK. But therefore, if the load increases in there, you know, if the load increases, that means the resistance of the load decreases down to one ohm then using Ohm's law, the current goes up to 120 amps. That's too high. We don't want our current to go above the 83 amps that the system's rated for. And the only way to reduce the current, because we can't reduce the um, resistance of the, the loads, because that's the loads that are doing that, the only thing the inverter has control over is its voltage. So the only way to reduce current is to lower the voltage. Using Ohm's law, um, if the uh, if the resistance if sorry if we want 83 amps and the resistance is one ohm we have to reduce the voltage of the inverter down to 83 volts to maintain that 83 amps and obviously 83 volts is too low for is too low for the load circuits so what happens is the static switch in the ups will say okay 83 volts is too low, but I have a good bypass apply at 120 volts. I'm going to transfer to bypass and uh, hopefully the load situation will be resolved. And then once it is, then we can go back to inverter once the current is reduced. I know that's a little bit complicated, but that is why we usually always transfer to bypass when you have a fault on the load circuit. Um, and the other reason is because of the current limit situation, the inverter doesn't have enough stored energy to clear um, a fault in many circumstances. But if we transfer to bypass, that bypass is fed from a really robust transformer. And that transformer has more than enough power to just clear that fault. And once that fault is cleared, the system can transfer back to inverter if you have uh, auto retransfer turned on. So hopefully that explained that. And here's a, a, just an example, a picture of that situation. If we have a fault on the load circuit here, then there's going to be high current going through the inverter bridge, which may damage the IGBTs. So what happens is the UPS says, OK, I'm going to turn this UPS, this static switch on. Power is going to flow this way, clear the fault. This will be disconnected, the inverter static switch, until the fault is cleared. And the reason we do that is to protect the IGBTs. We don't want them to blow up. And the next misconception is all the printed circuit boards inside our UPSs should be plug and play. And it should be easy for us to just uh, send you out a brand new board and you should be able to plug it in and um, not have any issues. We truly wish that that was the case. But unfortunately, all printed circuit boards usually have analog to digital converters on them. And then in that process, we have to use resistors to drop the sensing of any analog value to the um, analog digital converter. All resistors, unfortunately, have tolerances. And therefore, we cannot guarantee the actual exact resistor value when it's manufactured. So this means that a lot of our PCBs have to be calibrated to the system that it is installed in to get the exact 
um, voltages and currents calibrated correctly because of those resistors. So if a board is replaced, the board will need to be calibrated. Calibration is a function that is protected in our menu. Um, only Amatech SCI field service engineers have the calibration password because if you mess around with any of those calibration values, you can cause the UPS to fail or even worse, you can damage and blow things up. So um, that's why we do not give access to uh, the calibration menu within our system. And the other thing why PCBs can't be plug and play is we have continuing R&D software development and obsolescence. The, you know, we have to replace the processes on our, on our boards more frequently than you would imagine. And um, that causes a huge amount of problems because the new ones that come along sometimes aren't backwards compatible. So R&D have to come up with ways to try and make our boards back, backward compatible as much as possible. But in some situations, there has to be some things that a field service, an Amatech field service guy has to go in and change when you go from one version of a board to another. So uh, hopefully these reasons explain why it's not as easy in some circumstances just to send you a brand new board um, and you just go in and replace it. If it's, for, if it's a like-for-like like board, yes, in most circumstances, you can replace it. But if you're going from an older system um, to new boards, then you are going to have issues when you replace the PCBs. The next misconception is I can move the manual bypass switch to the bypass position without following a procedure. I wish this, this were true, but it, unfortunately it's not. The bypass switch is a make before brake switch. So this intentionally parallels the output of the UPS to the bypass supply for a short duration while the switch is moving positions. So if you imagine you have, let's treat them as two generators. If you have two generators and you are gonna parallel them, most people would know that you would have to synchronize them together before you parallel them. But if you don't, and you close that bus tie between the two generators when they are unparalleled, it can cause a huge amount of circulating, circulating current and can do a lot of damage, okay? And that is the same for UPSs. Although the UPS does everything it can to be synchronized to the bypass supply, there are gonna be some circumstances where, let's say the bypass is out of tolerance, so the UPS goes to its free running frequency of 60 hertz, or there are some big loads in the plant getting switched on and off at the time that you want to transfer the UPS, well, your, your bypass supply may go out of sync because the frequency is going to change when those big loads are uh, changing. So a phase difference could happen, and that can cause a lot of issues. And if you see this picture here, if you follow this dotted line here, the bypass supply is at the top of the AC waveform and the bottom here, the inverter output is at the bottom half of its AC waveform because at this point here, they are out of sync, okay? Completely 180 degrees out of sync. So that means we're gonna have a 170 volt peak on the bypass and we're gonna have a negative 170 volt peak on the inverter. So that means on either side of this contact, the bypass to load contact, there's gonna be a difference of 340 volts AC. So if we closed that contact, we are gonna cause a huge amount of circulating current to flow usually from the bypass uh, input. And that will usually flow into the UPS and damage uh, the inverter IGBTs. Um, worst case scenario, what it will do is because there is high current, it will trip the bypass MCC input breaker here. And if you've just gone to bypass and this breaker here trips, you have no bypass. So you have dropped the load. So that is why we never ever recommend that you move the maintenance bypass switch without following the procedure on front of the UPS. And what the UPS will tell you to do is to go to static bypass before you move the switch to maintenance bypass. And what that would do is it would make this power source here, this 
would be your bypass supply. So you would have bypass on that side of the switch and you would have bypass on that side of the switch. Because they are identical, there is no voltage difference at this point here. And you can close that switch without any issues whatsoever. Okay, I think this could be one of the last slides. So if I have a parallel UPS, when I switch parallel UPS, when I switch to bypass on UPS A, it shows the static switch as open on UPS A. Why didn't it switch to bypass? As discussed before, it's never good to have two voltage sources parallel. So in that situation, what we're seeing is UPS B is going to be on inverter, but we switched UPS A to bypass. And if they're in parallel, that's two different supplies. And that's not good. So our UPSs are intelligent enough to know that. So what they will do is if you press bypass to load on inverter A, because you want to do maintenance on it, then what it says is, okay, I'm going to open my static switch. I'm going to take inverter A completely out of the situation. And UPS B is going to carry on on its inverter static switch and feed the load. OK, so that is the correct operation when you press bypass to load on any Amatec SCI UPS that's in parallel um, with another Amatec SCI UPS, then the static switches are clever enough to know that it will switch the static switch off rather than go to bypass. And I think this here is to explain that situation. So basically, you can see here, UPS, this is UPS A, this is UPS B, and we've pressed bypass to load. And you can see that both static switches here are now off. And the, the flow of current is still through the inverter static switch for UPS B. OK. So that way, this point here is not in parallel with this point here um, and not causing any issues. Oh, I do have one more. If I'm on bypass, I still have battery backup, right? No, sorry, absolutely not. Once you are on bypass, either static bypass or maintenance bypass, you are not supplying load from the inverter. And whenever you are not supplying power from the inverter, then you are not connected to the battery because it's only the inverter that changes the DC back to AC. So if the inverter is not supplying the load, you do not have any battery backup. OK. So you can see here we are in bypass operation. So if bypass fails, you don't have a path from the battery to go through the inverter because this static switch is off. So if you are in bypass and your bypass fails, unfortunately, you will lose, lose power to the load because the battery cannot supply the inverter through the inverter static switch because it is off. Oh, even more. Goodness me. The UPS says it's in bypass, but the switch is in normal. What's going on? I'll go over this very quickly. What it usually means is when the UPS says it's in bypass, that's static bypass. It's electronic bypass. OK, so either someone has pressed the bypass to load push button on the UPS or the system has transferred to static bypass due to a fault. OK, but the maintenance bypass, which is completely uh, independent of the static bypass switch. So you could have the, the maintenance switch in either bypass position or normal position. OK, that doesn't affect which position the static bypass is in. So um, in most situations, if you walk up and you see the UPS is saying that you are in static bypass, then the first thing to do is try and press the inverter to load push button because the system is clever enough to know if there is still a fault present, it won't go to inverter if this will jeopardize the load. So if you press inverter to load and it won't go to inverter to load, then give us a call and we'll help you out. But if you walk up to a system and it says it's in static bypass, uh, try and press the inverter to load button. And this just explains. So if the RMBS is in the normal position, the power flow from the bypass goes through the static switch and out to the AC output. So it doesn't matter 
um, whether the inverter is running or not when you're in that situation because the power is flowing from bypass through uh, the contacts in normal position. This is static bypass, okay? That static bypass and going down here would be manual bypass. I know it's been a lot of information today. So, uh, ooh, there we go. Any questions? So what I'm going to do now is go through um, our chat bar and see what questions I can find. And if you want to type in any questions uh, while I find the first questions, please feel free to do so. So the first one is, our facility has a UPS that is actually called a lighting inverter. Are there some distinctions? distinctions between a UPS versus a lighting inverter, or are they the same thing? The only, they are exactly the same thing. The only thing that I have seen is in some lighting inverters, they don't go to the length of having a bypass. Basically, they just want to know that if you have a power failure, that you will go to battery operation. Sometimes, because they want to save costs for lighting inverters, sometimes you will not have a bypass. But in most cases, a, an emergency lighting UPS will be the same as a normal UPS. Okay. Somebody asked, what will happen if you have a failed static switch in the event where the battery had depleted, depleted and the DC to DC converter had also initially failed? Um, if you have a failed static switch and you have no way to transfer the, the load to bypass, you will drop the load, okay? How often should components such as the converter board, inverter board, and static switch be replaced? Um, that is on a manufacturer recommended basis. For Amatec SCI, we recommend that you replace um, the printed circuit boards and the AC and DC capacitors every 10 years. Okay. Somebody else asked, I would like to know if the AC capacitor located at the output of the inverter are not balanced or if one of them failed, do we have synchronization problems between the inverter output and the bypass source? That's a good question. Um, and the answer, the easy answer is no. Um, basically on a Digital UPS, in other words, for an, up for an Amatec UPS, that's our DPP system that uses pulse width modulation. The AC capacitors on the output of the inverter are only there to smooth out the uh, pulse width modulated waveform into a sine wave. It doesn't affect any phase shift whatsoever. So if you had one capacitor fail, then all you're going to do is you're going to have a little bit of a noisier output, uh, but you're still going to synchronize without any issues. On our ferroresonant systems, if an AC capacitor fails um, on the ferroresonant tank circuit, then what will happen is, once again, it doesn't affect the frequency of the UPS. It will only affect the output voltage. And for uh, you may see the output drop by maybe two, three volts, but it's not going to cause the frequency to shift. So an AC capacitor failure should not cause any issues with synchronization between the inverter output and the bypass source in the majority of cases. Okay. Somebody asked, when should we close the battery breaker again? You should follow the procedure on the front of your UPS or in the manual. When if you if if the battery breaker has tripped, it could be as simple as just reclosing that battery breaker. But there are some circumstances where, the, if especially if there's been a power outage, you want to make sure that the rectifier has come back on and the DC capacitors inside the UPS have been charged up or pre-charged. So please do follow the recommended uh, startup procedure to close that battery input breaker again. Uh, so what is the efficiency of both the rectifier and inverter? Depends on the manufacturer. Um, for an Amatec SCI UPS, if you combine both the rectifier and the inverter, then I think we are in the mid 80%. Um, efficiency, actually. Do I have a manual here? 
Let's have a look. I'm trying to find the efficiency. Regulation frequency. No, oh, it's not in this manual for some reason. I would have to get back to you on that, but I'm pretty sure that for both of our systems, it's around about 85%. Uh, percent. Um, I think the inverter is 90%. The rectifier is the, the, the part that's more inefficient. Okay. You will find out other manufacturers if they use an IGBT rectifier. We use uh, a rugged, reliable industrial rectifier with SCRs. If you use IGBT rectifiers, you can increase the efficiency. But, you know, we, the world that we supply our, our UPSs to, they are more concerned about keeping their load circuits protected at all times rather than efficiency. So that is why we use reliable designs, our SCR designs, our inverter bridge designs. They're all extremely reliable. And yes, it is a little bit at the expense of uh, efficiency, but we want to make sure you are protected at all costs. So that is why we do that. What is the main difference between the bypass switch and the static switch? Very good question, and it always gets asked. The static switch has no moving parts. That's why it's called a static switch. It's actually an electronic switch, okay? And what the UPS does is it can choose which supply to use, whether it's the inverter supply or the bypass supply, and it automatically chooses whichever the best supply to use, and it is a seamless transfer. A bypass switch is a manual switch. Somebody actually has to physically move that switch or change the breaker arrangement, and it actually has moving contacts, um, and there is no automatic. The UPS cannot tell the, the, the bypass switch, the, the manual bypass switch, to open and close. That has to be done manually uh, with somebody to change it. Uh, some jumper cable between UPS unit and bypass panel need to be supplied by Amatech. Uh, if you, that will be supplied, if you buy a separate UPS and bypass switch, then it will be the, the designer of that system that will have to supply the cable between the UPS and the bypass panel, unless you bought the system as a whole um, and they are connected together at the factory at Amatech SCI. Otherwise, it will be um, the end user who will have to supply the cable between the UPS and the bypass power. Somebody has asked, is it, is it not recommended to use 208 input voltage source circuit? We do, uh, it's as simple as replacing the input transformer. You can run 2083 phase into our rectifier as the AC input instead of 480. Um, you can specify that when you design your system and it's not a problem. We just change the transformer. But in most circumstances, most people use 480 because um, it reduces the current, therefore you get to use smaller cables. Um, but there's no reason why you can't use 208. Okay. What happens if you do lose the IGBTs? Is there a risk of losing other control boards in the process? Our systems are designed that if you lose the IGBTs, if the IGBTs do blow up, you will transfer to bypass. You will not drop the load, but IGBTs are inherently very sensitive to overcurrents and the circuits that feed the IGBTs could in theory be damaged because of that, because if the, the the IGBT fails short circuit, then the gate emitter junction could be shorted and therefore you could see high voltage on the gate signal, which is actually just a, uh, a logic level signal in most cases. So you could use your lose your gate drive as well. Um, you shouldn't lose your actual control boards, but the gate drive board, board could go as well as the IGBTs. Uh, somebody has asked, are we going to have the presentation slides by email? You will have a link 
to um, a replay of this um, webinar. We do not, in most cases, give people the PowerPoint presentation because it is proprietary. Um, somebody's asked, what about using downstream small critical load UPSs to maintain critical loads during breaks of service from main UPS? I've seen that done. You can do that. Um, Personally, I think it causes more issues because if what tends to happen is if you use small UPSs at the critical loads, then the batteries inside those UPSs get forgotten about uh, because they're usually because they're small UPSs, they don't get put into your maintenance procedure or your maintenance budget. And therefore, three, four years after they're installed, their batteries are pretty much shot. And if you do have a failure on the main UPS and you need the batteries inside that UPS, they are not going to be available. I've seen that so many times. So in truth, um, I can understand the logic behind doing that, but I would recommend against it. You should be able to rely on a good quality main UPS for your critical loads, especially if you have a remote manual bypass switch that allows you to take the UPS in and out of service. Another question is, is your manual bypass interlocked? In the majority of cases, it is not. But if you do want an interlock, we do supply a an RMBS that has uh, solenoid controlled interlocks or Kirk key arrangements where it can have interlocks if necessary. But in the majority of situations, our manual bypass switches are not interlocked unless specified at the design stage. Uh, OK, is there an inconvenient is there an inconvenient on the UPS in the event where the UPS AC input voltage and the remote bypass transformer AC input voltage are not quite balanced or frequency fluctuations between input voltage from the power distribution system is more critical to a good UPS system? The only thing that the UPS cares about when it comes to the frequency fluctuations between the input voltage on the bypass and the inverter is whether it synchronizes to that bypass supply. So in most cases, what we'll find is that situation arises when you are running on a temporary generator. And if the temporary generator is not very big, uh, its frequency and voltage can be unstable. And what the inverter does is it says, okay, I'm gonna look at my bypass and I'm going to make sure it's within tolerance. And the tolerance is usually uh, plus or minus 0 0.5 uh, hertz on frequency. And I think it's either 5 or 10% on voltage. Um, I'd have to check that up to remind myself. And if it's within those windows, the inverter will synchronize to the bypass. If it's out with those windows, it says, OK, I'm going to forget about the bypass. And I'm just going to run at my own internal frequency, which is set at exactly 60 hertz for North America, 50 hertz for um, most of Europe and Asia. So hopefully that explains that. On the AC input to the rectifier, the 480 volt AC input to the rectifier, it is very, it's got a very broad input tolerance when it comes to frequency and voltage so that voltage can go all over the place in truth and the rectifier will still try and change that ac into dc as much as possible so really the only tight tolerance is on the synchronization between the inverter and the bypass supply would the ups switch to battery in case of dropped input voltage even if the bypass has a totally isolated alternate source, such as a utility or aux generator. So let me read that again. Would the UPS switch to battery in case of a drop temper voltage? Absolutely, yes. Um, we is That's the default operation of our system. We want to keep the power fed from our inverter because the UPS only has control over one thing, and that is its output voltage and frequency. That's the only thing that it can control. So if everything else in the world goes wrong, 
the inverter says, okay, I know I can make 120 volts AC, 60 hertz. I can do that all day long as long as I have DC uh, input, whether that's from the battery or whether that's from the rectifier. So the design of Amatec ACI UPS is say, if we lose main power input to our UPS, then we will not transfer to bypass. We will stay on inverter and run off the batteries, even if you have an alternate source fed from a utility or aux generator. Okay. In most circumstances, the design engineer should have designed the UPS so that the MCC that feeds the AC input to the UPS, that MCC should be fed from a backup generator, not the bypass supply. Because what happens is once the, if you lose power, you usually have an automatic transfer switch that turns the generator on, runs up to speed, and then um, the ATF closes power should go to the rectifier of the UPS and the battery should go back on charge. Once again, because the inverter is our only controllable source. Um, when running on batteries, is there a way to calculate the inverter power draw? Um, yes, actually, it's um, basically the, the load power um, divided by uh, the, uh, the efficiency of the inverter, which is around about 90%. So um, you, can, you can do that when running on batteries. Um, you can calculate what the inverter power draw at full load. And in fact, the design engineers should have done that calculation for you because that's how they size the batteries. Um, uh, you know, if you have a 10 kVA UPS, there's a calculator that you can use to say, okay, um, the current draw at full load is going to be um, this amount. So therefore, I need a battery to give me, let's say, 100 amps for three hours. So uh, there is a way to do that. And if you need any information on that, uh, please contact us. Uh, Brooke is going to put the email address to contact us uh, in the chat bar, and we'll be able to help you out with uh, that calculation. Uh, I see 208 volt single phase. Um, we do not at this moment in time have a single phase input for our rectifiers. All of our rectifier inputs on our UPSs are three phase, it's either three phase 480, three phase 208, or if it's Canada or other places, it can be three phase 600 volts. Okay. Uh, most network equipment have UPSs built in. Um, in the network data center situations, I don't know if that's exactly true. Most network equipment will have a, a, an AC to DC converter. Um, so, uh, but it, I don't know if most network equipment have UPSs built in. I could be wrong. We don't work in the data center industry. We work in the industrial uh, UPS industry. Um, Let's have a look. I think that is all the questions that we have. So I know that's been a minute, uh, sorry, an hour and 20 minutes. So uh, I apologize for taking so much of your day up. But we had some really great questions at the end there. So um, thank you for that. Watch out for an email coming soon um, for our next webinar um, and also please do um, submit your surveys that come in we really want to hear what you have to say we want to know what subjects you would like covered in our next webinar uh, so please do um, let us know what you would like us to discuss um, and once again brooke has put in the chat bar our uh, email our links um, so if you want to get in contact with us and i will say as well we have restarted our training um, our in-person training in our houston uh, training center uh, we've actually got a training class going on uh, as we speak this week so if you are interested in training we have uh, full covid19 precautions in place uh, perspex uh, plexi shield uh, 
barriers everywhere. We temperature check everybody that comes in um, and uh, everything is done as per the CDC guidelines. So if you are looking to get some training before the end of the year and your plant will allow you to come and visit us, then please go and see our training website um, and we will quite happily um, book you into our class uh, whenever the next one is. Don Imley is our training manager. He'll be able to give you that information. Okay, so that is everything. Once again, thanks again. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Hopefully I didn't bamboozle you too much because it's a, a lot of information in this presentation today. And um, I truly appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next time we have our webinar. Until next time, thanks again and take care.